All right, moving on to section 1.4. Let's look at uh, solving systems of linear equations. Okay, so this will be our primary application of matrices. What we'll do in this section is give an algorithm for solving a system of linear equations. That algorithm is called the Gauss-Jordan method. We'll have a couple of versions of it. One I prefer over the other. I prefer the easy one, uh, the one that requires the least amount of overall arithmetic, really. And this algorithm will give us a unique solution when a unique solution exists. It'll give us multiple solutions when multiple solutions exist. And it'll give us um, the fact that the system of equations has no solution, if that's the case. So you get a definitive answer out of this Gauss-Jordan method is the real punchline. All right. So what we say when we mean uh, a system of linear equations is the following. Here's a system of M linear equations and N unknowns, conscious choice of those parameters, because we're going to use matrices to represent these equations. And that's where we get these double subscripts from, very reminiscent of what we saw in the last section when we were talking about matrices. So M equations and N unknowns, let the unknowns be X1 through X sub N. Such a system is this. So we get A1 X1 plus A1 2 X2 and so forth up to A1 N times X sub N equals B1. So what we have here, here, is a linear combination of the unknowns, x1, x2, up through x sub n, set equal to some constant. Uh, if we only had x1 and x2, maybe you refer to them as x and y, we'd have something like ax plus by equals c, which is the equation of a line in R2. So I'm looking for linear and all this linear stuff, looking for lines in this linear stuff. Um, but you've dealt with these kinds of things before. Um, graphs of such things represent um, lines if we were in R2. We're not in R2 necessarily. We're in, most often we're in higher dimensions than two when we deal with these things. But we get a repeat of that type of equation. So we've got linear combinations of the x1s through x sub n set equal to some constant. And we've got m of those types of equations. So we've got one, two through M equations and one, two through N unknowns. Okay, of course, we're gonna to wanna to write that in terms of uh, a matrix as suggested by the double subscripts then. And we'll want to solve this system of equations. Well, that's what the next definition deals with. We can write this system in terms of uh, AX equals B, where we take A, to be the obvious matrix, the matrix with a sub ij as its entries, with m rows and n columns. It's called the coefficient matrix when we do that. And then we'll take vector x to be the vector uh, with unknowns x1 through x sub n, or the vector with components x1 through x sub n. And then we'll take vector b to be the vector with these components. All right. Uh, we might want to check the dimensions real quick. Matrix A would be M by N. Vector X would be uh, N by one. So I don't have an explicit version of it written out here, but we've got M by N times an N by one. Okay, that product exists. Yields an M by one, in fact. And vector B is an M by one matrix, if you want to muddle the distinction between vectors and matrices. Uh, which I need to do when I talk products like this. But the dimensions are perfectly in line. Uh, and a solution to this system of equations is some vector s. So we found numbers, which we can plug in for the x's, such that as equals b. So we're looking for solutions. This parameter s is just mentioned in this particular note, arguably definition. Uh, we're solving for the X's. That's the puzzle in all of this stuff. And we will do so using some matrix ideas. The augmented matrix for the above system, just to put some verbiage on this, is the matrix we would get 
by, it's a little vertical line here is read augmented by, so this is matrix A augmented by vector B. And matrix A is a coefficient matrix, okay. Um, it's augmented with this components of this vector B. The augmentation makes sense because the number of rows of matrix A equals the number of components of vector B. So everything lines up nice and neat. There's no empty spots. And really what this is, is just shorthand for the system of equations. We've dropped all the X's, dropped all the pluses, dropped all the equals, and written it in this form. This contains the same information, if we know how it's encoded, as a system of equations contains. Uh, look at, uh, hey, look at this entry here. What's that correspond to? Well, it's in the second column, so it corresponds to uh, a coefficient, it is a coefficient of x sub two. Actually, there it is right there. It's a coefficient of x sub two in the last equation, the last row of the matrix. So I could take this system of equations and write it as this augmented matrix, or I could take this augmented matrix and write it as a corresponding system of equations. So these are just different notations for the same thing. All right, what we're gonna do is talk about how we might manipulate the equations and use that as inspiration for how we're gonna manipulate matrices, how we're gonna manipulate augmented matrices that come out of systems of equations. All right, uh, we'll perform certain operations on the augmented matrix, which correspond to the following manipulations in the system of equations. We could interchange two equations. Now you write them in a different order, that doesn't change the solution. We could multiply an equation by a non-zero constant. All right, so if I go back up here and look at the second equation, if we multiplied both sides by five, that doesn't change anything. Uh, the solution to the original system of equations would be the solution we would get by replacing this equation by five times the equation the multiple of five going on both sides. I multiply by zero, that wasn't allowed. You multiply by zero, you're losing that equation and you're losing information and you're changing things. So we could multiply both sides of an equation by a non-zero constant. That's why the non-zero requirement. Or we could, and this is a productive one here, replace an equation by the sum of itself and a multiple of another equation. All right, we'll go through and illustrate this at great length. But what that might mean is, um, yeah, I could take uh, the first equation, multiply both sides by two, and add it to the second equation. Multiply by two, and get twice this, equals 2b1, equals, and then add those two quantities to the second equation, for example. That wouldn't change anything. I've uh, really just taken the second equation and added the same thing to both sides. Added the same thing to both sides in a particular form. It's a multiple, a non-zero multiple. I'm gonna add mul zero multiples in this setting as well, but that's just adding zero. But I add a multiple of one of the other equations to this given equation. Hopefully you would agree those three things do not affect the solution to that system of equations. So what we're gonna do is encode that, those manipulations in manipulations of the augmented matrix associated with the system of equations as follows. So we're defining these as elementary row operations. You could interchange row I and row J it corresponds to just uh, interchanging two of the equations. You write them in a different order, the same system of equations, it's got the same solution. That would correspond in the augmented matrix to interchanging two of the rows, say row I and row J. Going to introduce a notation to represent each of these row operations. I will use these whenever I row reduce anything. You will use these whenever you row reduce anything, it's going to get graded. That way you can tell what I've done I can tell what you've done. If you've made an arithmetic mistake, I can see, well, I know what you meant to do. You were thinking about it the right way. Partial credit for you. 
or if I'm doing one and I make an arithmetic mistake, you'll give me a little break as long as I was inspired to do the right thing. Um, thinking, well, hopefully you're thinking partial credit. Um, when it comes time to grade your work on this, uh, and when it comes time for you maybe to double check your work, you work through a homework problem, you don't quite get the same answer they got in the back of the book. Well, you've documented what you did along the way. And it's really that that's more important, in my opinion, than just a straight up arithmetic. Um, so this helps us communicate with each other by showing these manipulations. So elementary row operations, interchanging row I and row J denoted like this. We can multiply the i row by a non-zero scalar S, taking row I, and replacing it with a little arrow there to indicate a replacement, replacing it with S times technical difficulties, S times uh, row I. So I multiply both sides of uh, row I, uh, well, I'm sorry, multiply both sides of equation I by S, corresponds to multiplying um, row I of the augmented matrix by parameter S, non zero scalar S. So that corresponds to the second manipulation of the equations. So that corresponds to something that would give us an augmented matrix for another system of equations with the same solution. If I can do it to the system of equations, I want the corresponding thing that I would do to the augmented matrix. Uh, what do we have for number three up here? Replace an equation by the sum of itself and a multiple of another equation. So I'm gonna take one of the other equations down here, one of the other rows, multiply it uh, by something. Let's call that something S again for scalar. And add that or add to both sides up here in a conversation about equations or simply add rows down here in a conversation about augmented matrices. So taking an equation and adding a multiple of another equation to it is equivalent to adding the i row to s times the j row, taking the i row and replacing it with what it was plus s times row r sub j. So these three row operations correspond to these three manipulations of the system of equations. These don't change solutions to the system of equations. So these are what? These don't change the system of equations. Well, strictly speaking, these aren't directly, though indirectly they are, related to the system of equations. Oh, this is matrix stuff. Yeah, yeah, but we know how to translate matrix stuff into system of equation stuff and vice versa. So if these don't change the system of equations and its solutions, then these things are things that we would do to the augmented matrix that would yield a different system of equations, but it's gonna have the same solution as the one we started with. For the same reason, these three manipulations with a system of equations don't modify the solution of the system of equations. We'll write this as a theorem here in, in a second. All right, so if you get matrix A uh, obtained from matrix B by doing a sequence of these things, these elementary row operations, then it's said that A is row equivalent to B, denoted with a little um, tilde similar. Um, some people might use an arrow. I prefer not that, I got my reasons. Um, those of you taking more theoretical math classes in the future will talk about equivalence relations. And these two matrices are row equivalent, and it's, a com it's common to represent an equivalence relation with a little tilde, similar symbol in LaTeX, um, but A is row equivalent to B is the relationship. The matrices ain't the same because you probably changed a bunch of the entries. Yeah, they're not the same matrix. They'll be the same size matrices. We didn't change rows and columns sizes anywhere in this but they won't be the same matrix. They will be row equivalent matrices. All right, so just as those three manipulations of the system of equations at the top of the slide, 
top of this page, didn't change the solution of, of the system of equations, then these row operations, when I couch this in the right language, well, they won't change solutions to systems of equations either, except they're manipulations not of the system of equations, but of the augmented matrix that represents the system of equations. So that's the couching it in the right language stuff. Let's take that formally and cleanly as a theorem. Theorem 1.6, invariance of solutions under row equivalence, says if we take augmented matrix A augmented with B, and that is row equivalent to matrix H augmented with matrix C, then the linear systems AX equals B and HX equals C have the same solution sets. All right, so you do these row operations and you create a new augmented matrix. That augmented matrix is associated with a system of equations. Got the punchline, the same solution, the same solution as the system of equations we started with. All right. Uh, in itself, that ain't terribly useful. It changes this question, if we blindly do this, into that question. So to solve in this system of equations, we could try to solve that system of equations. But the big picture is you do these things, these three elementary row operations, these two systems of equations will have the same solution sets. So the plan is to take a system of equations that's hard to solve and change it into a system of equations that's easy to solve. So we won't just blindly do these row operations. We'll do these row operations with a specific agenda. That agenda being making a nice system of equations that we can solve. Okay, what does nice mean? Well, looks like we're really shifting gears here. Um, we are in a sense, but we're trying to get to what would be a nice system of equations to solve and what would its augmented matrix look like. So some terminology about matrices. A matrix is in row echelon form, abbreviated REF, if first, all rows containing only zeros appear below rows with non-zero entries. So if it's got a row of zeros, it has to be at the bottom and the first non-zero entry in any row appears in a column to the right of the first non-zero entry in any preceding row. Okay, so uh, one final piece, I guess. Um, the first non-zero entry in a row is called a pivot. I have no clue why. We'll refer to them as pivots because the rest of the world does. Um, and this is a claim about the location of pivots. The first one, no problem. You got a row of zeros, it has to be at the bottom for a matrix to be in row echelon form. The second one uh, says uh, the first non-zero entry in any row. So the pivot in any row appears in a column to the right of the pivots in any preceding rows is the implication. Let's illustrate that. So let's try to get this statement visible at the same time as we do the example. Okay. This matrix, is it in row echelon form or not? Uh, doesn't have any rows of zeros, so that first part is irrelevant. How about the pivots? Pivots the first non-zero entry in a row. There's a pivot, there's a pivot, and there's a pivot. So we found the pivots. Do they appear in the right spot? Uh, any pivot appears in a column to the right of the pivots preceding it. Yeah, in other words, the pivots go down and to the right, down and to the right. So the second condition is a restriction that I don't have a pivot up here and a pivot directly under it. I don't have maybe a pivot up here and pivots to the left of that first pivot below it, the pivots have to go down and to the right, down and to the right. Now they don't have to go down and directly to the right as we'll see when we do many examples, but they do have to go down and to the right one or more spaces. They've worded as, as in a column to the right of. So it could be that we've got a pivot here, say where the one is, 
we've got a zero there and the first non-zero entry might be where the five is. Okay, that, that would still be down and to the right to be illustrated at great length. Yes, these go down and to the right, these pivots, that's, um, that's row echelon form. How about this one? There's a pivot, a there's a pivot, and there's a pivot, first non-zero entries. We got a problem. This one goes down and to the right, this one goes down and to the left. I can't have this as a pivot. I'm sorry, I can't have this as a pivot in a row echelon form matrix. First on zero entries are the pivots. This one isn't in like the right place for the matrix to be in row echelon form. No, not in row echelon form. The pivots go, don't go down and to the right. This one goes down and to the left from the second to the third row. How about this? First non zero entry, first non zero entry. Ooh, a row of zeros. Uh, and it appears at the bottom, so thumbs up. Condition one is satisfied. This is the first one that has a row of zeros, and it's at the bottom, so we're good on that. For the second condition, we've got a pivot here and a pivot here. Oops, but that's a problem. The pivots have to go down and strictly to the right. They can't be one pivot on top of the other. This does not, this pivot one does not appear in a column to the right of the pivots that precede it. It's in the same column. So no, not in row echelon form. Yes, no, no. Pivots have to be down and to the right, down and to the right, in a matrix that's in row echelon form. All right, let's um, look at a system of equations. Okay. Uh, Jesse, some down and to the right stuff in the system of equations. Uh, the technique we're about to use is called um, back substitution. Uh, if an augmented matrix is in row echelon form, we can use this method of back substitution to find solutions. So uh, let's take this system of equations. Let's go to the supplements. All right. Consider this system of equations. Uh, its augmented matrix would be one, three, negative one, bar augmentation, bar four. Zero, one, negative one, augmentation, negative one. Zero, zero, one, augmentation, three. Where would the pivots in the augmented matrix be? Uh, here, down and to the right, here, and down and to the right and there are no rows of zeros. It have to be an equation that read zero equals zero coming from the system of equations. So indeed, um, this system of equations would have, listen to all the words, this system of equations would have an augmented matrix in row echelon form. Keep the words right, and I'll be careful with this stuff because it matters. Systems of equations aren't in row echelon form, matrices are. The kind of matrices we're interested in at this stage are augmented matrices associated with systems of equations. But it's the, the augmented matrix that's in row echelon form, not the system of equations, just to keep the words in the right environment. All right, well, can you solve this? Yeah, well, I already know x sub three equals three. Hey, we can plug that back into this second equation x sub three equals three, plug a three in there, we'd have x sub two minus three equals negative one, x sub two minus three equals negative one. Take that negative three to the other side and you'll find x sub two equals two. Hey, now we know uh, x sub three and x sub two, we can plug both of those into the first equation and solve it and find that x sub one equals one. So we get x one equals one, x two equals two, and x three equals three. So, this is called a method of back substitution. I mention it because the book mentions it. I don't like it because we got a better way than this back substitution, uh, but we will go through it as it is a topic of linear algebra. All right, an easy system of equations to solve. And um, I can think of an easier system of equations, but that was pretty easy. So if we, started with a system of equations that wasn't so nice. Here's one version of nice. This is kind of nice. There's, there's nicer than this. If I could take the original system of equations, however messy, and turn it into something like this, that is, 
take its augmented matrix and put it in row echelon form, then we could use this back substitution technique to go through and solve the system of equations. And that's not complicated. But there's less complicated still. When we look at systems of equations, they may not have any solutions, in which case they're called inconsistent. Uh, if they have solutions, they're called consistent, and we'll see that consistent even yields two different possible outcomes. So we might have um, no solutions. Let's look at this system of equations. Another example, let me find it. Okay. Consider this system of equations. All right, let's explicitly make the augmented matrix this time. Here's the augmented matrix. All we did was pick off those coefficients, two, one, three, coefficients of x1, they're the first column, one, negative one, uh, zero. I recommend you write these the way I write these and the way the book writes them. Leave a little gap there. There's zero x sub twos. I mean, you gotta put a zero in the matrix. So align the equations the same way you know they're gonna appear in terms of the coefficients in the augmented matrix. So when we find the augmented matrix, we get this. So for the first time, and nowhere near the last time, let's use elementary row operations to do some reduction, row reduction, okay? Um, plan is, I wanna see, um, We'll see zeros here and here. Well, and here, already got one there, but that might change as we go through this process. I wanna see zeros there, there, and there. Then we would have in our terminology of um, uh, the previous section, I think it was, the matrix, this part of the matrix, below the main diagonal, we'd have only zeros. We'd have a, what a upper triangular matrix, we call this. Um, but if I get zeros in these three positions, then I can just solve this using back substitution, the way we did the previous one. Okay, so my strategy on this, this is big picture stuff, is to get a zero there and there and there. All right, I say, let's swap row one and row two. I got my reasons, they'll become apparent when we do more arithmetic on the next slide. Let's swap rows one and two. Okay, so I write the one, negative one, three, one in the first row, and I take the entries in the previous first row and put that in the second row. Doesn't change anything. It didn't help apparently that much either. Okay, let's see. Um, now, I want to use this one to eliminate that two, and I want to use this one to eliminate that three. That's the reason I wanted a one there. See how much we got on the next page. Um, it would be a bunch of arithmetic. So what I'm gonna do is let's take this first row, multiply it by a negative two, and add it to the second row. That'll give us a negative two times one plus two. I'll give you a zero there. Now, a bunch of stuff will happen to these other entries, but we'll get a zero there. Let's take this first row, multiply it by negative three, and add it to the third row. That'll give you negative three plus three, and give you zero there. And a bunch of other stuff will happen over here. One bad thing is I think we'll probably lose that zero, but we'll get it back. That's the reason I wanted to take the one up top. I want to use the one to eliminate the two and the three. Could you use the two to eliminate the one and the three? If you like fractions, go to town. Now I could take this first row, multiply it by negative a half, that produce a negative one here, and then I could add. Yeah, I'm also gonna have a bunch of other halves over here I'm gonna have to do arithmetic with. I could multiply this by negative three halves. First row, multiply by negative three halves. That'll produce a negative three here, add to here to give a zero, and a bunch of fractions throughout. I'm saving trouble of dealing with fractions. Now, I may be stuck dealing with fractions sooner or later. I'm of the opinion later is better. So that's the reason we swapped row one and row two. You'll get the hang of this when you practice them. Uh, then I can use the one to eliminate, and there is none of this one half stuff that'll pop up, at least not yet. So the plan is we'll subtract twice row one from y2, row two, and we'll subtract three times row one from row three. 
subtracting twice to get rid of the two and subtracting three times to get rid of the three. And a bunch of other stuff will happen too. So this is arithmetically intense. What I say, subtract twice row one from row two and subtract three times row one from row three. Uh, row one won't change. We didn't do anything to it. Row two was, and the information's here, it's, these things are hard to typeset and be readable and fit all on a single slide. Row two was two, one, negative one, one. From that, we're subtracting two times the corresponding entry in row one. Previous entry minus two times that entry. Previous entry minus two times that entry. Previous entry minus two times that entry. You get the picture. And when we simplify that second row, sure enough, we get a zero there. In a third row, we were gonna take the third row and subtract three times the first row. Why? To get this zero here. So it looks like it's worked. So I'll take the previous entries, three, zero, two, three, I suppose, and subtract three times that corresponding entry in row one. Previous entry minus three times that corresponding entry in row one, and so forth. Do the arithmetic, three minus three times one is zero. Do the other arithmetic, be careful. It's, you change the numbers down here, you've totally changed the problem. And it's easy enough to do because you're doing lots and lots of arithmetic. That thing about partial credit, if you wrote this down, you know what you're doing. Maybe you messed up some of the arithmetic. You'll probably pay for it uh, in the long run because I'll try on tests to give you nice numbers. Uh, the questions in the book largely involve nice numbers, not always. I can't always get nice numbers on the test questions either, not throughout the course. But I can postpone fractions if I think ahead. We, we did. And we got, let's see, to this. Um, I don't want, let, let me name that equation star or matrix star. Uh, we're going to come back to this, but I'm, I'm forging forward blindly with the fact that I wanted a zero here, here, and here. Oh, man, we had one there and we lost it. Yeah, but we gained one here. Now, I want to use something to get a zero here. Uh, can you use this negative one? Yeah, but if you use that negative one, I'd multiply by three and add, that'd get us a zero there. Yeah, it'd mess up this zero here, though. Uh, let's use the second row. Let's subtract the second row from the third row. The zero won't mess up the zero. The three will be subtracted from the three to give us zero, and some other stuff will happen. So the plan is to take row three and subtract from it row two. All right. Uh, row one and two don't change. Go ahead and write those out. I'm doing this by hand. And now we'll take zero minus zero is zero. Three minus three is zero. Told you so. That's the reason we did that. Um, oh, look at this. Negative seven minus negative seven. That's going to be zero as well. Zero minus negative one. Uh, it's going to be one. I want to call attention to that down the road as well. Okay, we were, uh, what the hell are we doing? Solving a system of equations. Uh, where are we? We have taken that system of equations, found its corresponding augmented matrix, and we have found, showing off all my words, a row equivalent augmented matrix that's in row echelon form. Row echelon form, pivot down and to the right, pivot down and to the right, pivot. So, row echelon form. No rows and zeros. This, this star star matrix here is in row echelon form. All right, then. Um, that should be easy to solve then. We'll just back substitution it. Mm, let's see. We're, oh, restatement of the, um, the question. All right, we know by theorem 1.6 that the solution to the original system of equations is equivalent to the solution of the new system of equations. Let's go back one, whoops, go back one more time. The solution to the original system of equations is equivalent to the solution to the system of equations, which has this as its augmented matrix. That was theorem 1.6. So, I think I want to go through and look at um, the corresponding system of equations here. 
it's bad. All right, so if we take that final augmented matrix, go through and look at systems of equations, let's let the whole thing out here. Uh, we got a problem. And that's the reason I put stars by those matrices. Uh, we had a problem back at star, a problem that persists in star star is labeled above. So that's the reason I called attention to those. Let's go back and look at matrix star. It says the second and third rows imply 3x of 2 minus 7x of 1 equals negative 1, and 3x of 2 equals negative x of 3 equals 0. Well, 3x of 2 minus 7x of 3 can't both be negative 1 and 0. When the left-hand sides are the same, that implies 0 equals negative 1. Let's go back and look at that. Remember, these correspond to systems of equations. The first one is x1 minus x2 plus 3x3 equals 1. No big deal. Second one implies 3x2 minus 7x3 equals negative 1. Third one implies 3x2 minus 7x3 equals 0. Well, we got a problem. That can't be both negative 1 and 0. So in hindsight, this catches my eye. Um, this is actually, when, when you're trying to work this kind, the easiest kind to do. Something's going to go wrong. We went one more step. Remember, these correspond to equations. The first one is whatever, so to say, the third one is uh, zero equals one. Well, zero don't equal one. I don't care what you choose for x1, x2, and x of three. We ain't gonna get zero equals one. So we have a subtle paradox here and a blatant paradox here. This says three x2 minus seven x three has to equal both negative one and zero. Well, you can't choose x two and x three that are gonna make that quantity, both of those things. And down here, it says zero equals one and something's wrong. So there's no solution associated with um, either the system of equations associated with star or uh, it's a little cleaner to look at star star. You, you can't have zero equals one. There's no solution to this. Their question was, is this a consistent or an inconsistent system? Does it have a solution or not? Inconsistent, it doesn't have a solution. Um, to kind of more reveal where this came from more directly, uh, hey, if I uh, were to add the first two equations together, we'd get three x1, hey, that's what this is. We'd have zero x2, hey, that's what this is. And we'd have two x sub threes, hey, that's what this is. On the other side, we'd have a uh, two. Hey, that's what this isn't. And that's really where the problem comes in. So I think I made this one up. But this is an inconsistent system of equations. It was revealed when something went wrong with the augmented matrix. So this technique we're using will allow us to find solutions when they're there. And it'll tell us that something's wrong when the system of equations has no solution, when the system of equations is inconsistent. What's next? I'm gonna do some more examples fairly similar to those. Consistent or inconsistent was inconsistent. Yeah, let's do another one. Consistent or inconsistent. You got a little hint on this one. This system has multiple solutions. Express the solutions in terms of an unknown parameter R. Three things can happen, and this is our third example. All right, in the first example, we found a unique solution. In the second example, 1.4.b, something went wrong, it had no solution. That's something that went wrong, say was zero equals one, inconsistent. In this case, it's gonna be consistent. In fact, it's gonna have infinitely many solutions. And that's the three things that can happen with a system of equations. Unique solution, no solution, or infinitely many solutions. Infinitely many solutions of a particular form. We're gonna express the solutions in a particular form. Okay. Um, hey, uh, you know, this looks a lot like what we just had, except the three that was causing a problem in that previous example, I replaced it with a two. We won't have that problem we had before, but we still got some weird behavior. Okay, um, let's do the same thing we did. Let's create an augmented matrix. 
Let's swap row one and row two like we did before. Let's do the subtraction to get the zeros like we did before. Uh, let's use the three to get a zero there like we did before. Remember, I'm thinking pivot, pivot, get rid of that, have a pivot over here. You must do it in this order. We'll take the first row, use it to fix the first column. We'll move down and over. We'll use the second row to fix the stuff below it, to get zeros below it. We'll move down and over, use that to get zeros below it and so forth. Ooh, in the process, I might wanna swap some rows around strategically to save myself some ugly arithmetic. As we do these, you'll see that. But the next step would be, let's subtract row two from row three to get a zero right there. You're gonna get some other zeros as well. And we'll interpret what that means. So take row three to minus row two. Okay, I actually get a whole row of zeros. It's at the bottom. So this matrix, this augmented matrix is in row echelon form. Uh, meaning uh, with this approach of back substitution, that's about as far as we can go. So we'll, we'll have something a little better than this very shortly. So uh, let's convert that back into the system of equations. Gives us something like this. Notice that third equation, I included it in the conversation. It says zero equals zero. Well, I started with three equations. You still got three equations. Yeah, what this really tells you is one of those equations didn't contain any information, not any new information. This is true, but it doesn't tell you anything. Yeah, zero equals zero. All right, from equation two, uh, we could rewrite this, say, as 3x sub 2 equals, let's take the negative 7x sub 3 to the other side, we get negative 1 plus 7x sub 3. Let's divide through by 3. Man, here comes fractions. I guess it was inevitable in this one. Uh, we put it off as long as we could. And solving for x sub 2, we get x sub 2 is negative 1 third plus 7 thirds x sub 3. All right. There's x sub two in terms of x sub three. Uh, let's substitute into equation one, this thing for x sub two. All right, so we had x sub one minus x sub two. Well, we know this thing with the thirds in it is equal to x sub two plus three x sub three equals one. Do your arithmetic, solve for x sub one, get all the other stuff on the other side and you'll get, trust me, you get two thirds uh, minus two thirds x sub three. So we found x sub two in terms of x sub three. We found x sub one in terms of x sub three using the second and first equations respectively. How are you gonna find x sub three? I haven't got any information on x sub three. Uh, I could write it in terms of the system of equations. Uh, if you like, I don't know, x one equals, x two equals, x three equals. I got no information about x sub three. How about this? X sub three equals X sub three. I don't know anything else about X sub three, but there's something I can say that's true about it. It equals itself. So what we now have is X one, X two, and X three in terms of X sub three. We're gonna introduce a parameter. This is what the hint meant. R for X sub three. And write X one equals X two equals X three equals in terms of that parameter R. We're stuck with fractions. This could have been done a different way without fractions. Um, more of that in the future. I'll, this was the natural way to do it, at least for the first one that comes out like this with multiple solutions. Uh, but there's other ways of doing this and maybe some ways to bear, bury those divided by three things, bury some of that fractional stuff. Uh, meaning pragmatically, you may get an answer different from what the book's answer looks like, yet still be correct. We'll do many of these and, and uh, illustrate that at, at greater length. But you'd have to agree, x1, x2, x3, they have to be of this form. Uh, what's a constraint on parameter r? What well, could be anything, because we didn't have any constraints on x3, we don't have any constraints on r. Given x3 equals r, then x1 and x2 have to be of this form. Uh, if you like, we can plug these things back in those systems of equations. We had 2x1 plus x2 minus x3. All right, let's plug this in for x1, this for x2, and, and r for x sub 3. If you'll do the arithmetic, we get out 1. That was the first equation. All the r stuff, it canceled out. 
and you were just left with one. Similarly, in the second and third equation, all the R stuff cancels out and you're left with one and two respectively in those, and that was the first and second equations. So this is consistent. That was their question. We kind of over answered it. Not only is it consistent, but I can tell you what the solutions are. They're vectors of the form x, vector x with components x1, x2, x3, where x1 is two thirds plus r times negative two thirds, negative one third plus r times seven thirds, and zero plus r times one. That's the exact information we have up here written as a vector equation down here. I got my reasons for wanting to write it as a vector equation. You want to express the answer like this. We had our conclusion at this stage that there were infinitely many solutions and we even had the form of them at this stage. Just double checking here, answering their question here and writing for reasons to become apparent in the future, writing those solutions in a certain form. More of that later. Back to the notes. Okay, in this uh, previous example, uh, that parameter R is called a free variable, and that solution we gave is called a general solution in terms of the free variable. And this is something you're going to have to deal with when there's more than one solution to a system of equations. It gets worse, there could be more than one free variable. Potentially nightmarish stuff, but not if you'll use augmented matrices and reducing those matrices down to rho echelon form. The book goes through, I think this is straight out of the book, uh, and describes this reducing a matrix to rho echelon form as the following. Um, if this works for you, excellent. It's probably going to be uh, slightly cryptic in terms of some of the, um, the parameters that they've introduced. But think, pivot, down and to the right, pivot, down and to the right, pivot, down and to the right. You need a technique that'll give you the pivots in those down and to the right positions. You got that? You got a row echelon form of a matrix. So you need a strategy, strategy to do that. I gave you one, this idea of get the, get the first column with a non-zero entry and a bunch of zeros below it. Down and to the right, get a non-zero entry if possible, and zeros below. So that's the strategy in terms of um, thinking pivots in row echelon form. Here's sort of an algorithm as the book describes it. They say, if the first column's all zeros, mentally cross it off. Repeat, repeat this process as necessary. So if you don't have any information about x sub one in the system of equations, you got a column of all zeros and you had no clue what X sub one is. Uh, yeah, this is definitely the book's wording on that. Uh, these in practice won't, won't pop up in what we do, I don't think. I don't think the examples in the book include any like this. Um, but this is certainly in general a property that a matrix should uh, could have. But when we deal with systems of equations, I don't think we'll see that. Use row interchange if necessary to get a non-zero entry, a pivot, P, in the top row of the remaining matrix. All right, so what they're saying is, if this first part didn't apply, get a non-zero entry up there in that one, one position. I say get a one up there in that one, one position because arithmetic with one is easier. May not be an option. You can't do arithmetic with zero. That's why you had to do this crossing off of a column of all zeros initially. But move things around until you get a non-zero entry in the top row of the remaining matrix, in the one one entry, if you've really crossed off other things. Then use that non-zero entry to eliminate the stuff below it. For each row R, below the row containing this entry P, this pivot, Add negative R over P times the row containing P to row R, where lowercase r is the entry of row R in the column which contains the pivots. That was a thing where we subtract twice the first row from the second row, subtracted three times the first row from the third row to get zeros. Um, here, we'd be subtracting in the example we had two divided by one 
we subtracted twice the first row from the second row, for example. Um, so this is algorithmically, it's fine. Seeing what arithmetic's being done is maybe a little fuzzy, but it's how you use that non-zero entry to get zeros below it. And if this non-entry, non-zero entry is one, the arithmetic's easy. That's why I wanted ones there. After doing that, quote unquote, mentally cross off the first row and the first column to create a smaller process and do it again. Uh, in particular, from there on out, you're going to be leaving the initial first row and column alone and reducing a matrix to row echelon form. You're, you have an agenda. You want zeros in certain places. You've got them as far as the first row and first column are concerned after you've done this process. So don't touch them again. You leave that first row alone. Because if you use the first row again, you're going to mess up some zeros you already have. You have to follow this in a certain protocol. You don't like algorithms and all this stuff. You'll get the hang of it by just practicing them. All right, let's do a couple of others. Next, use elementary row operations to put this matrix in row echelon form, REF. Okay, we have a strategy. And uh, what do you think? Uh, you want to use the two to do arithmetic? You want to use the four to do arithmetic? Or you want to use a negative one to do arithmetic? I think I'd rather use the, the well, negative one. We could change it to positive one by multiplying through by negative, if you like. Uh, I, I think I like that number. Though, hey, look, you could divide the first row by twos, and that gets you a one there as well. Uh, you could divide the second row by fours, and that'd get one there. Yeah, get you three-fourths over here. So I don't like that. Totally valid. I'm just afraid of fractions a little bit. All right, well, we'll do whatever I've typeset because that's what's going to happen. Uh, let's swap row one and row three because that's what it says to do. You want to divide row one by two? That's an excellent idea. And that's the downside of this interaction. You suggest to me you want to do it by dividing the first row by two. Well, we're going to do it the way I typeset it. So sorry, online stuff. Um, but that's totally valid. Uh, it would lead you off in kind of uh, potentially initially a different direction, but would give you a correct solution. Might not look like the solution we're about to get, but it would be correct if you get this in row echelon form without arithmetic, arithmetic mistakes. Same here on me. So let's swap row one and row two. That'll get us a negative one up there. So do that, swap row one and row, sorry, row one and row three. Uh, get the negative one up here. Of course, all the entries come along with it from those rows. And now let's use this negative one to eliminate that four and that two. We're fixing the first column effectively. How so? Uh, multiply by four and add. Multiply by four, this will give us a negative four. Add it to that, it'll give us a zero. Down here in the third row, multiply the first row by two and add. Give you a negative two and a zero here. And a bunch of other stuff happens. So what are the operations? Take row two, binary um, elementary row operation is take row two and add four times row one. Yeah, add four times to get a zero there. Take row three, add twice row one, right to get a zero there. Here's the arithmetic. We're taking the old entry, subtract, um, adding four times what's in the first row. Down here, we're adding twice what's in the first row. We may have to do for bigger matrices, more and more row operations, but you'd be very careful to keep them isolated. Um, in one set of row operations, don't change something that you're using. For example, we've changed row two up here. Don't use row two in a computation down below. That, that's fine later, but don't do it in the same step. You'll get lost in the arithmetic. So we did those elementary row operations for those reasons to get zeros here and here. And this yields, after we do the arithmetic, I guess it yields this thing here. Okay, uh, we'll have this in row echelon form if we can get a zero there. I propose we do the following. Let's swap rows two and three. Swap rows two and three for ease of computations. I'm avoiding fractions. Uh, 
we could what? We, we could have used a negative four to get rid of the negative two. We'd had to divide by two and that would introduce the three halves over here. We'd have to do arithmetic, but it's easier just to swap stuff. Okay, so swap row two and row three. Now I'm gonna use a negative two to eliminate the negative four. Well, negative two divides negative four, piece of cake. And I won't have to do any fractional stuff with this approach, though the other approach is totally valid. I'm just avoiding fractions. So we'll take um, row three minus two times row two. What is that? Uh, negative four minus two times negative two would be, here it is, negative two, uh, sorry, negative four, plus four, it gives us a zero. Yeah, it gives us a zero out. So subtract from row three, twice row two, to get a zero there using this negative two. Some other things happen. You know, this stuff over here on the left, because we got the zeros already there, this, those will never change. Unless we use row one, I told you to leave row one alone. If you use row one, you're gonna mess up these zeros underneath. That's why we're going down and over and always looking below at this stage. Do the arithmetic, produces this. That's, uh, that's row echelon form. So that's an answer. Uh, yeah, I said we could uh, maybe start out by dividing, uh, what did I say here, word of warning, row echelon form is not unique. For example, uh, we could pull, okay, so we could take this one and change it. For example, we could multiply um, row one by negative one to produce this, that's an elementary row operation and the pivots are still in the right place. Uh, we could take row two and divide it by negative two. Okay, uh, that'd produce a one here and here, right? Um, that two is a row operation. We could divide row three by seven. We can make all those pivots one. That's what, what's been accomplished with these manipulations. That's another possible answer. So both of these are correct answers because they're both row equivalent to the original matrix and you know why because you've documented it. You've documented exactly what the row operations were that you used to convert the original matrix into this one. Or here's a three more row operations that converts it into this one. This ain't the end of the story on forms of matrices. Um, later on, we're gonna want the pivots to be one. So I've done additional work here, unnecessary work to answer the question they asked. So really the big warning here is, hey, there's a bunch of different ways that we could express a matrix in row echelon form. Here's two different versions for the matrix we were just given. Infinitely many versions are out there. We're gonna do a different kind of row echelon form. It's called reduced row echelon form. Gonna like that better, that's unique. You do it right, there's only one answer. And let's see, I wanna do another example, wasn't it? Yeah, let's look at this system of equations. Uh, let's solve this. This one's out of the book. It's our first one out of Frehley and Beauregard. Put the augmented matrix in row echelon form. Use back substitution to solve it. Okay, here's the augmented matrix associated with it. Coefficients, right-hand sides of equations, augmentation bar. Let's put these numbers in the appropriate place. What you want to do? Ooh, let's use the two to eliminate the six. We'll subtract three times row one. That'll do it. Let's subtract row one from row three. Two minus two, give us a zero there, and a bunch of other stuff happens. But the row operations will be, take row two and replace it with row two minus three times row one. Take row three, replace it with row three minus row one, as promised. So there's the row operations. That's why you want to do those row operations. We're fixing the first column. We don't want pivots down here. Okay, do the arithmetic. Uh, let me gloss over this. You can rewatch the video or look at the hard copy of the notes. Uh, we get all these numbers here, click, simplifying, we get this. Of course, this comes with a warning. You do these by hand, it's, it's pretty tedious stuff, so you need to practice it to get better at it. But with practice, it'll become almost routine. Okay, uh, how are we doing on row echelon form? Pivot pivot, uh-oh, pivot, down and to the right, uh, down and to the left, so that won't do. Uh, let's swap row two and three. A legitimate elementary row operation, pivot, down and to the right, pivot, down and to the right, pivot, row echelon form. So we've got the augmented matrix, 
row equivalent to this matrix. This matrix is in row echelon form. They told us do that and then solve the system of equations using back substitution. Okay, so now we gotta go from matrices back to equations. So take these two, one, negative three, line zero, turn it back into two X plus one Y minus three Z equals zero. And similarly for the other two equations. So taking augmented equations, turning them back into matrix, um, taking the augmented matrix, turning it back into a system of equations. Oh, and um, because we've got the augmented matrix, in row echelon form, the system of equations can be solved by back substitution. That was the plan. All right, so what, z equals zero, we can plug that in here, then we can find y, then we can plug that and the zero in here and find x. That's what back substitution is. Third equation tells us z is zero. Plug that into the second equation as given here. Solve for y, you'll find y equals two. Plug in y equals two and z equals zero in the first equation, you'll find negative one, there's a solution. We only got one solution? Yeah, it's because there is only one solution. If there had been more solutions, something else would have happened. That's the beauty of Gauss-Jordan elimination, or the Gauss-Jordan method. If there's a unique solution, it'll find it for you. If there's no solution, it'll tell you there's no solution in its zero equals one way, as we saw in that second example that we did. If there's multiple solutions, it'll tell you what those are and it'll give you the form of them as well. So this is pretty robust stuff. Back to the notes. All right, so the technique we just used is called Gauss reduction with back substitution. So back substitutions and added to this, um, row echelon form stuff. And one final observation, and we'll stop this video before it's too long. Um, the system AX equals B is equivalent to the system of taking a linear combination of the column vectors of matrix A with the components of vector X as coefficients. So saying X equal, AX equals B, matrix A vector X equals vector B is equivalent to this linear combination of the columns of matrix A set equal to vector B. You believe that? That was note 1.3 point A. I told you remember note 1.3 point A because you're gonna see it again someday. Well, it's someday. Let's jump back and look at it though. So let me jump back to section 1.3, happen to have it right here. Um, page two, pages two and three. We had looked at um, AX, matrix A, same notation we're using now, vector X, same notation we're using now. You did your row times column thing, produced this matrix, and then we peeled it apart as this linear combination of, well, matrices or, or vectors, usually call them column vectors, but they're matrices as well. So we get from that manipulation that AX is a linear combination of the columns of matrix A. Let's highlight it. AX is a linear combination of the columns of matrix A with coefficients being the, co the components of vector X. That's what we just said. All right, so solving AX equals B, that is finding the X's, is the same as finding the X's so that this is true. Huh. And that's a, a linear combination of vectors. So if you can find a solution to this, AX equals B, then you can find coefficients X such that this linear combination of the column vectors of matrix A equals vector B. That is, AX equals B is a consistent linear system of equations, if and only if vector B is in the span of vectors A1 through A sub N, the columns, column vectors of matrix A. What, what was span again? Was a set of all, what was it? Linear combinations, it's a linear combination right here. So you can find X's that makes this work, that is 
that expresses vector B as a linear combination of A1 through A sub n, that is B is in the span of A1 through A sub n, if and only if you can solve this system of equations. Right, because the solution vector x to the system of equations tells you exactly what coefficients in this linear combination to use. Apparently totally different questions. They're really the same question. They're in totally different settings. This is a system of equations or represents a system of equations. And this is some linear combination. Yeah, well, turns out they're the same, same question, different environments. So let's stop for a little while and we'll come back and finish up this section in uh, part two of section 1.4. I'll see you there.